Welcome to today's webinar called Common Collection, Collection Conditions, Assessing the Condition of Your Paper-Based Collections. I'm Heather Hendry, the Senior Paper Conservator at the Conservation Center for Art and Historic Artifacts, and I'm glad you could join me today. Just a bit about Dipsy before we get into the topic at hand for anyone who is unfamiliar. Dipsy is a five-year initiative to deliver essential training and services to New York's collecting institutions. Dipsy's services include archival needs assessments, preservation and conservation surveys, guidance with strategic planning, and a variety of educational programs, such as this webinar, and in-person workshops. In these services available free of charge to New York-based organizations that collect, preserve, and make accessible historical records or library research materials, which is all of you. DIPSNY is a collaboration between two long-running New York programs, the New York State Archives Documentary Heritage Program and the New York State Library Conservation Preservation Program, which is how we got this great acronym. It's, it was established in 2016 by the New York State Education Department's Office of Cultural Education to ensure consistent and comprehensive services to the network of organizations that safeguard New York's records. My name is Heather Hendry, and I work for CCAHA, which is a regional conservation lab in Philadelphia, where the Dipsney program is based. In a typical year, the education department outside of Dipsy presents about 45 educational programs. The Preservation Services Office does over 50 survey projects. Our digital imaging studio will digitize six terabytes of information, and conservators will assess and treat over 6,000 individual objects. So there is staff dedicated to Dipsy, but CCHA also serves clients across the country, and so New York State clients are eligible for services both from Dipsy and through CCHA. Today, I want to help you to identify and understand condition issues that make your collection vulnerable to future damage. Assessing condition can happen as a standalone survey, but it's often most efficient to integrate it into other processing tasks. And I also want to make it easy to rank your preservation concerns so that you can compare the urgency of different needs. And of course, I understand that both the largest and the smallest institutions, everybody is working with a limited budget, so not everything can get done. So it's not always possible to reach the highest possible ideals, but it lets you know what direction you want to work towards. My job today is to guide you towards understanding your collections, needs, and priorities so that you can make the informed decisions. If you have any questions while I talk, I believe you can pop them into the chat at any time, and I will try to address them as they come, and there'll be more time for more questions at the end. Um, I think in the webinar format, everyone will have to put questions into the chat, and then I'll be able to answer from there. So normally, I'm the paper conservator in the room, and I'm the one that tells you the repository what is a problem and what to do about it. But when you look at the millions of documents at thousands of institutions in New York State, there's not going to be enough conservation to go around. So we need to empower everyone possible to understand condition issues. This, no damage, of course, is good, but some damage is finished. It's done and it's not going to get any worse. Some damage is likely to worsen or to cause further damage. And some types of damage, like if you think of active mold, are a current and urgent hazard to both people and other collection items. So the people who are regularly interacting with your collection, whoever that is, are going to be the ones who spot and flag the problems that need to be addressed. 
Using everyone's eyes will get you the most information so that you can make the best decisions within your own institution. See, any time that your collection will be viewed is a time to be spotting condition issues. There are three parameters for determining your response to an object's issues. Condition, mission relevance, and the use of the artifact. The mission relevance and the use are going to be individual to each object, but condition is something we can understand fairly universally. So the losses and damage in this picture are undeniable, but you might use different judgment if this was the founding document of your town versus the weekly receipt for onions. Assigning preservation priorities is integral to effective collections management and preservation planning. As you're all followers of Dipsy programming, I'm sure you've all heard us go on and on about policies. The methods that we'll talk about today will give you tools to document preservation problems that be can be used to revise and create your policies with real evidence as the basis for your plans. Assigning priorities will also help you to focus your time and resources for preservation, for organization, and fundraising efforts. It'll help improve access so that if you have fragile collections and there are certain items that have been flagged for condition, it's easier and faster to make decisions about whether that collection is available for research or if there's just a few items you should separate before letting a researcher browse through it. And this is so important. When preservation pro problems are already documented, then your grant applications are going to be much more effective. Again, this information can be collected at any time that the collection items are being reviewed. Where to keep this information will depend very much on how your institution collects other information about the objects. Many systems can work for you, but they should be easy to access and work with your other collection information. The conservation priority levels that CCAH recommends using are urgent, high, moderate, low, and none. And again, the condition is a fairly objective physical state, but the actions that the condition calls for will depend on the use and the mission relevance. There's a lot of judgment calls to make when you get into the action, and the answers might change depending on your institution and your current situation. So let's dig into what these different levels mean. Urgent is any issue that will spread to other unaffected collection items, and it could even risk the staff's health and safety. This category will always be the highest priority requiring immediate attention. That could include bringing in professionals, isolation, freezing, or deaccessioning and disposal. So urgent is the only priority level where the importance and the use of the object almost don't matter because the object can damage other more important collection items if action isn't taken it must be addressed as soon as possible, even if the action is just to segregate it or to deaccession it. So this is evidence of active mold on the left and active insect infestation on the right. Both of these will spread to other collection items if they're not addressed. A high priority item are objects that are actively losing information. So that should be next in line for conservation treatment. We'll talk about spe specific damage types in a bit, but a high priority item reflects ongoing damage that is getting worse even in ideal storage conditions, and it will get much worse if it is used. So that might include significant structural damage, severe embrittlement, severe damage or tension from the housing or secondary materials, uh, losses and flaking of the media, or amateur repairs that are causing ongoing damage. 
both of these examples are damaged, there's risk of loss to the object. And most importantly, the damage is continuing to get worse. So on the left, the paper has become so brittle and lacy that handling would cause significant problems. And you might see other equal amounts of tears that would not be a high priority if the paper was strong and flexible. In both of these cases, the paper is weakened because of the inherent nature of the materials and the chemical processes and the weakening are going to continue. So it even, becomes even more fragile and loses even more bits over time. So to really hammer in the distinction between high priority and urgent is that a high priority object is a danger to itself. An urgent priority object Objects that would be considered moderate have a high likelihood of eventually losing information if they're not given further attention, but they're not in immediate or active danger. For example, this could mean that some leaves with content are loose, but unless they're handled irresponsibly, they will not be lost. Or the loose grime at the top edge of this newspaper could be ground in deeper or transferred to other areas by careless handling. These are items where handling and access should be restricted to trained personnel, so the condition may be limiting research or digitization. Now, a great deal of your collection is going to fall into the low priority category. Almost every piece of paper that has existed and been used will have some damage, but most of it does not need to be addressed. Objects that are in fair condition due to issues like minor surface soil, small tears, creases in the margins, or small losses are all considered low priority. It's possible that the condition would worsen with handling, but for the most part, the material is secure and stable. And just to be realistic, most things that are low priority will never be addressed unless they're needed for an exhibition or they're absolutely pivotal to your collection. And that's okay. It doesn't harm your low priority items to give them deferred maintenance, no matter how long the deferral ends up being. So given the age of most collection material, it's unlikely that you'll find any objects in perfect condition but a priority of none does not mean like a mint brand new condition. Very light wear that doesn't merit any further attention apart from normal safe handling could be categorized as none. Uh, modern materials like photocopies or new books probably don't need anything even if they don't quite look printer fresh. These items do not put the item at any risk for further damage, and there's little that can or should be done to correct minor cosmetic issues. Now I want to pivot to talking about the type of damage and deterioration that you would see in a paper collection. But we're all going to always keep those priority levels in mind. So we're always connecting the condition that we see with the amount of urgency that we should feel. And we're hoping to eventually have more webinars that will get into photos and books, which have their own specific concerns, but we're going to focus just on paper objects this hour. When you're examining an object to assess the condition issues, it's important to be systematic in order to be efficient and thorough in your assessment. It can be helpful to orient yourself with a few standard questions, like what are you looking at? So the type of object will help you understand how the object has been used, and it'll clue you to look for certain kinds of issues. So if a work of art was exhibited for aesthetic purposes, it was probably uh, exposed to a lot of light, but less handling. So you might expect issues related to light damage like fading of the colors or yellowing of the paper. If it was archival material, 
that's used for research or for daily activities, there might be condition issues related to handling, which would be like dirt or grime or physical damage like tears. And also thinking on the same level, where does the primary value of the piece come from? Is it the aesthetic properties or the informational properties? So say you have a piece like this where there's large tears and tape along the edges. If it were going on exhibit, most of the edges could be covered with a window mat. If it was only or primarily valued for its informational value, then putting it into a polyester sleeve will protect it from further loss, but still let researchers examine the text. And of course, it would always be ideal to take, remove the tape stains and mend the tears, but in a world of limited resources, you may need to make choices. If we move on to what it's made of, this will help you to examine all parts of an object that could have a condition issue. Paper objects may include very different types of paper. Uh, the media can vary, and there's sometimes additional materials present like adhesives, stamps, seals, staples, paper clips, and each added component will have specific potential condition issues. Examining objects for condition may need a little more handling than just cataloging them, so you'll need to take extra care. When you're handling flat objects, you want to avoid causing abrasion and think about how you're retrieving an item from its enclosure. We recommend using folders instead of envelopes for storage to avoid surface abrasion for this reason but it may be that some of your collection is in envelopes. If this is the case, we always recommend that you don't reach inside the envelope. You just sort of pour the object out into your hand for better access. You would lift flat objects with either a micro spatula or another piece of paper or cardstock, which is always a good idea, but extra necessary for items with fragile and brittle edges and you need to carefully flip the flat objects without creasing them. You might want to use a handling folder to help in flipping these over. When you're looking at condition, looking at the back of a paper object is really important. There's a lot of information there that you may not be able to see from the front. And so that's why you're handling objects a little more aggressively than if you're just consulting them for research purposes or for cataloging. I think the middle picture shows moving sheets of paper over short distances, like from one side of a desk to another. You would use a flexible support. And in this picture, the conservator is using polyester webbing, but thick paper, blotter, or mat board will also work. You want to pick up the two opposite corners very gently and maintain some tension so there's a sort of a hammock that the object is lying in. So you don't want to force the object to bend too much, but you also don't want to be too loose, so you're still creating the curve that you control. And you have to consider whether the object can bend at all if you're choosing a flexible versus a rigid story, uh, support material. And my last piece of advice on how handling is get help. If you're ever thinking to yourself, do I need help on this? then the answer is yes, you do. There's a large number of items in between what you can handle alone very easily and an item that you definitely need help. All those in-between stuff, you could possibly move them without help, but it's riskier to do it alone and it's safer to do it with someone helping you. So why take risks when you could get help? Now, as you examine things, to understand what you're looking for, I would put deterioration into three broad categories. So there's chemical deterioration, which would be paper becoming brittle 
oxidizing, discoloring, staining, adhesives breaking down, media breaking down as well. There's physical damage, which would be like tears, losses, abrasion, folds, creases, flaking media, and then biological deterioration, which is when your object's actually being digested, whether it's mold or bacteria, insects or vermin. And each of these types of deterioration can open pathways for other types of deterioration to occur as well. So in this certificate, it was originally folded and stored folded. And so then the creases and splits that developed along the folds were a physical damage, which was then repaired with tape at one point. The tape held it for a while, but then began to cause those stripes of chemical damage, the darker areas here, where you see oxidation and embrittlement caused by the tape. When the paper became more brittle areas, you see the fragments that started to break off and become lost. And that's caused by the chemical deterioration that then led to additional physical deterioration. Um, so you see how the physical and chemical weaknesses can interact and many types of damage can be connected. And just as a quick note here, I'd like to also add that tape is really never the answer. And even the ones that are marketed as, ar as archival are not recommended to use on your collections. Getting into uh, possible chemical damages, I think that yellowing and acidity are the most commonly seen markers of age in paper. Before about the mid-1800s, Western paper was made from flax, hemp, and cotton fibers with gelatin sizing, and the paper quality was pretty good, which is why the paper supports on many very old Western drawings and manuscripts on paper from this time are still in good condition. After the mid-1800s, when wood pulp fibers were being used more and more, there was a real decline in paper stability. So wood pulp is composed of about half and half cellulose and lignin. Cellulose fibers are what make paper. So cellulose builds the cell walls in plants, whichever plant is used to make the paper. Lignin is like a glue that glues the cells together really tightly. And that's what makes tree trunks more rigid compared to other plants. If the lignin is not removed when the paper is made, it adds bulk to the paper, but it doesn't add any strength at all. And as lignin breaks down, it will become more acidic, discolored, and brittle. Cotton and linen fibers are more stable because they're composed mainly of cellulose, which is really the strength of the paper. Not only are they chemically different, but wood fibers are also much shorter than other plant fibers. So the fiber network in, the, in a wood pulp paper is less strong to begin with as well. When acidity is present, it can transfer to an adjacent item as well which is one of many reasons why keeping newspaper clippings can be so problematic. In addition to the presence of wood pulp, there was unstable sizing agents that were commonly used from the mid 1800s through the early 1900s. The alum rosin sizing really, really increases the rate of paper deterioration. Papers made of wood pulp with alum rosin sizing are very difficult to preserve because the materials are just of such poor quality. And here's an example of the acidity transferring to adjacent items. You can see the discoloration on the book pages, which were a better paper, only occurred where it was in contact with the newsprint bookmark. You can also use this principle to your advantage sometimes, that if you can interleave and folder your acidic collection with alkaline buffered materials, 
you can absorb acidity away from the collection to help preserve it. So discoloration and acidity go hand in hand, but they're not exactly the same thing. All papers are going to develop some acids over time, but poor quality papers just develop them much faster and to a higher level. Some of the acids that they develop are yellow, some are colorless, and many non-acidic degradation products are also yellow. So a stable alkaline paper could still have some yellow degradation, but nobody is going to test the acidity levels in your paper. So it's reasonable to use yellowness as an, and brown color as an indicator of acidity. Um, and that gives you a lot of information just going by the color that you see developing. And <laughs> the brittleness that you see in paper is a result of acidity. So a thinner, weaker paper with short fibers, you know, that's usually wood pulp, it will shatter before a thicker, stronger paper that's made with longer fibers. But hopefully you'll be recognizing and protecting against brittleness before the paper breaks. Once a paper can become, has become brittle, it really can't stand to be flexed at all. So it needs very special handling and storage. In addition to the possible brittleness of the original artifact, it may be attached to a secondary support that is more brittle. This is often seen with documents glued to cardboard, where even if the paper is fairly stable, if, if the brittle mount breaks, it will damage the attached paper too. So this is a case of a reasonably good paper that has discolored because it was in contact with an acidic window mat. The brown rectangle is the line where the edge of the window was transferring acidity onto the print. It's made worse by light exposure, which can break the cellulose up, that again results in both yellowing and a loss of strength. In the case of matte burn like this, the discoloration is usually more of an aesthetic problem and embrittlement is not as much of a concern because the weakened area is really small and localized and it's often only occurs on the front surface. So the back of the paper will remain stronger. So this is a damage that's unattractive, but it's also fairly stable. Um, a discoloration when something is in contact with poor quality housings can also be more extensive if the acidic materials are touching more of the object. So in this case, uh, you can see the back of the object has really dark bands of discoloration around the edge and up the center. These areas are really fragile because they go more deeply through the paper and the discoloration and embrittlement is most pronounced where the object is exposed to both acidity from housing and oxygen in the air. Foxine is a local discoloration that's defined by its appearance. It's the specific occurrence of reddish brown spots in paper. And the stains can come in a variety of sizes. Um, the potential for an object to have foxing is believed to start at the time of manufacturing because it's understood to be the action of contaminants in the paper. Namely, it's either metal inclusions or fungus that were introduced into the paper during manufacturing. These impurities in the paper can remain latent for months or years or may never appear unless the conditions are right. Foxane seems to appear in unstable climates, especially when there's high humidity. But you want to be really careful not to mistake foxane for mold. Mold is highly contagious and it will contaminate and grow on nearby materials and it will get worse quite quickly. Foxane is generally harmless. You might see it traveling th very slowly through contact 
So several pages in the book may have a spot in the same place as it moves in a three-dimensional way, but it won't spread spores and it can be greatly slowed or even stopped by lowering the humidity. Like most types of staining you'll see in paper, it's very difficult to reverse without an invasive conservation treatment, but it's really an aesthetic concern and it will have a minimal effect on the longevity of your object. Uh, staining is another condition issue that's largely aesthetic. So as we talked about, paper is likely to develop yellow discoloration over time. A great deal of this discoloration is water soluble. So if a discolored paper is exposed to water or another liquid, the discoloration will dissolve and it's then pulled as the water dries. It gets pulled out and it deposits at the edge of the wet spot, what we would call the wet dry interface, because that's where the water is evaporating away from as that spot dries. So it leaves all the discoloration at the edge. You see the water stains here have a lighter center where the discoloration washed out and then a darker outline, what we call the tide line, where the discoloration was left. And of course, if the liquid had its own color, like if these were coffee drops, then that would also be more concentrated in the tide line than in the center of the stain. These stains may be unattractive and they will become harder for a conservator to remove as they age. But if the information is more important than the aesthetics, these stains are not actually endangering the object. And here you see other stains caused by contact with materials. There's a rubber band, a metal paper clip, and pressure sensitive tape. So removing these items can also cause physical damage because they become stuck to this area and that area is also weakened where they were in place. So removal is not generally recommended if there's any difficulty or pressure needed to take them off. Iron is especially corrosive to paper. So paper clips, staples, and other metal fasteners can cause a lot of local damage. But the severity also depends on the location. So hopefully the fasteners are located in the margin so the information might not be affected. And while we're talking about iron, uh, when we get to iron gall ink, the iron content is actually in the media, it's in the information. Iron gall ink was the most common ink used for writing for centuries. I gave a really deep color that started out fairly black, but it becomes more brown over time. The condition of the ink will vary depending on the recipe used, the paper quality, and the storage conditions. But in general, the ink is both corrosive because the iron is rusting away, and it's acidic because of the recipe of the ink. So the top image is showing extreme iron gall ink deterioration where it starts to break along every heavy ink line and then islands that are surrounded by ink will just fall out so you'll see chunks like this missing or the center of every o will fall away the bottom left is an example of how the ink looks when it's fresh or in good condition it may soak through the page or be a little visible on the other side but then in the right side of the same image, you see what it looks like as it ages. It, be, it gets these halos that develop and it sinks through the paper much more. So all brown ink manuscripts prior to, I'd say 1950, should be suspected of iron gall ink, but the condition can vary a lot. Like even though all three of these images are iron gall ink, I would rank these as a low priority for the fresh one. The one that says day 14, relative humidity 90% is sort of a medium priority. And then the one that's shattered and losing information is a high priority.
Now, pretty much all paper will have some surface grime. It might not be visible, but there is grime that could be lifted if a conservator were to surface clean it. Light overall grime is not a great concern. It should be removed so that it doesn't get embedded during other conservation procedures, but it's definitely a thing that you could defer maintenance on. On the other hand, if you see the heavy grime at the top edge of this newspaper, this is loose and it's likely to transfer. It could get grounded more deeply or it could cause fingerprints in other places. So heavy loose grime is a much higher priority than sort of overall ordinary grime. We use the word accretion for any distinct mass that's deposited on the surface of a material. So accretions are aesthetically distracting. They can cause staining of the paper like this one did, but they could also cause a lot of losses if they're removed improperly and just peeled away because they're stuck so tightly. <coughs> Sorry. Um, Food-based accretions, are, I hope, are not common in your collection, and I hope they're not still happening. Um, but they can be a bigger problem because they can attract other pests, and this one is growing some mold on one of the tomatoes. So that needs to be dried out as well as hopefully removed, or um, possibly that information could be captured in a different way to get the tomato out of the collection. Distortion is generally caused by previous storage or use. So the creases in the map on the left are not a great problem by themselves, but you should be aware that they are a weaker area in the paper. So this is a place where tears are likely to start. Long-standing creases from folds that have been there for decades may prevent paper from being opened fully, so they also need more careful handling in those cases. The cockles in the right picture, the, the tight regular undulations, are caused by fluctuating relative humidity. In this case, the edges of the poster was restrained while the center expanded, and so the paper solved that tension with the cockles. A cockled paper will be much more difficult to store because any pressure could cause either abrasion along the peaks of the cockles, or it could even crack if, the, if it's brittle paper that gets pressed flat by something on top. The extent of tears and losses and the strength of the remaining paper is really what determines their condition priority. In the case of the envelope here, the loss isn't over any media, and the tear is not likely to spread. So I would categorize edge tears and losses that are unlikely to spread or snag on anything as a low priority. The architectural drawing on tracing paper, on the other hand, is on a weak paper. There's many open losses and tears that could get bigger. And there's a completely detached section in the bottom corner that could get lost. So this is a medium to high priority. And the housing of this may determine whether it falls into medium or high. If we take a look at the media, flaking media occurs when the ink or paint is in a, in a solid film that's not well bonded to the layers below. As the media ages, the layers will crack and start to detach, and any movement of the paper will worsen the flaking. This occurs most often in heavy applications of watercolor, but also with ink on parchment. In general, these cracks and losses are very small, and magnification is needed to detect flaking, um, especially if you want to catch it before it becomes a really severe problem. If you see any flaking or cracking in the media, the best thing to do is to keep the items stored flat so that the detached flakes don't go anywhere at all. 
And ideally, these items would be placed in deep window mats or shallow boxes with, with no folders on them so that nothing is touching the flaking service. A conservator can assess the flaking and could consolidate loose areas. But if this is really hard to provide in your collection, you might need to assess this piece in terms of mission relevance and accept that there might be information loss. And I should add that pastels and charcoal are naturally friable, which is not really the same as unintentional flaking. And so these pieces would need special housing and handling, but they may not be actual candidates for cons consolidation because that's just how they're made. Um, abrasion can be any damage from rubbing, so it could result in shiny marks, losses to the media, scratches, or skinning. Skinning in particular is a loss to the paper support that doesn't go all the way through. It's just the top layer of the paper fibers. So in this case, the skinning around the margins was caused by a window mat that was glued to the print and then ripped away. And this area is weaker because the paper is now thinner. And it's also more likely to get grimy because the paper fibers are open and lifted rather than a smooth surface. This is also an example of local discoloration where the edges were covered by the window mat and so the light exposure only discolored the area where the image is. When you look at a uh, paper with skinning, it's really important to understand what caused the skinning because another major cause of the loss of surface fibers will be insect grazing, which is a very different event. Silverfish in particular um, really like to nibble along the top layer of paper and so their damage can look like white trails in the image, like in the bottom picture. Some insects will eat right through the paper, which is a structural damage. And you may also see little brown and black dots that are insect droppings left behind. When you see insect damage, it's really important to determine whether it's active or historic. So if there's an active infestation, this is a very urgent situation. But historic damage, where the insects are gone now, it's not going to get worse. So that only needs to be evaluated in terms of how weakened the paper is. And mold is also a very serious issue for paper collections. And we offer a lot of programming specifically for addressing mold. Mold outbreaks, as well as damaging collections, are also a health hazard to humans as well. Active mold will excrete enzymes that can alter, weaken, and stain paper, cloth, and leather. And in addition to affecting collections, mold remediation on your building can be very expensive. Active mold can be halted just by lowering the humidity because mold needs moisture to grow but mold spores can survive long periods of dryness. So mold can start to regrow whenever the humidity rises. Active mold is an urgent problem that will spread, so it really has to be a top priority if it's ever discovered. So to review some of the condition issues that we discussed in terms of priority levels, Urgent items are items that are a danger to other collection items or to people's health. High priority items are a current and ongoing danger to themselves. They will continue to lose information if they're not addressed. Sometimes an improved housing can take an object out of the high category, like putting a very fragile piece into a mylar sleeve. Medium priority items definitely need intervention, but their needs are just not as immediate and they will still deteriorate over time. Low priority items do not need conservation for preservation. However, they may be considered for conservation based on their use or their mission importance. It's perfectly reasonable to defer maintenance on low priority items. 
Ideally, I would hope that none of your collection qualifies as urgent or that if it does, it will be addressed and none of your collection will qualify as urgent a year from now. I would expect to see, you know, generally much less than 10% of any collection described as high priority. It's usually only a handful of items. The bulk of any collection's needs will be categorized as medium, low, or none. And the distribution here will vary, but in general, most of these items really need proper housing and handling more than they need conservation. I thought we could do a quick review now where we look at all the same damage examples and quickly go over their priority level. So I encourage all of you to play along at home as we go through these. The brittle and staining pressure sensitive tape can be a medium as long as we get this object into a secure housing. The brittle pages in the top right are also a medium. A medium. I would also use housing to bring this one down from high into the medium category. The broken letter fragments are a medium and housing is the answer again. And if that newsprint bookmark can be removed, the stain on the book is a low priority. The shattered book here is a high priority because there's just too many brittle fragments to house it safely. The foxing on the sailboats is a low priority because this is an aesthetic intervention versus a stabilization for longevity. The discolored print in the bottom left might be a medium depending on how brittle it is. It's kind of hard to judge from a photo of it. Um, but the mat burn in the bottom right is a low priority. This is also an aesthetic concern. A pressure sensitive tape is usually a medium, although we might say if it was all in the margins, we could call it a low, lower priority. The staining uh, in the bottom left is low priority, but it still might merit some intervention based on use or mission relevance of this piece. The iron corrosion is medium, and it could be high if more of the information was affected. Here we have the three examples of iron gall ink condition levels. So the heavily corroded iron gall ink is a high priority, while the fresh good condition ink is low, and the one that's beginning to have halos and strike through is a medium. The loose surface grime and the tomato are a medium priority, although when I looked at the mold bigger, that might bump that up to an urgent as well if that mold is active and growing. Um, the creased map and the cockled poster are low, assuming they could be housed safely. The loss on the envelope is a low priority, but the tears and losses on the architectural drawing are a high priority and the flaking paint and ink are also high priorities. The worm trails are probably a low priority unless that paper has become too lacy to handle it at all. And the skinning in the margins is also a low priority. Dealing with the actual silverfish in the bottom corner is an urgent priority. But the damage that he's caused to that paper, that's a low priority. And in the bottom right, if the mold is active or the document is wet, this is also urgent. But if the mold has been dried out and the object is segregated, I would reduce this to a high priority. And now that we're good at observing and categorizing damage, you need to capture that information as well. As you're going through a collection, it's really easy to look at the most glaring or obvious damage. So if you're keeping track of your condition with just a few words in order to be efficient, the less important things might not get mentioned. But imagine if last year, one of your collection pieces was examined for conditioner and the examiner mentioned that there was major tears and staining present. 
but they didn't mention the two wormholes in the coroner. Does that mean that since that exam, you've had insects eating your collection in the last 12 months? Or were they just considered not worth mentioning when there were more important types of damages present? This is why I recommend a checklist. And there's all kinds of options for a condition checklist. And different categories might suit different collections better. But the idea is that if a box isn't checked, the examiner did look at that condition and think about it, but it was not present. Now, I like to have space for notes as well, but it may be more information than your institution needs. And my checklist for preparing to treat an object may not be the same type of checklist that you would need for capturing a snapshot of conditions throughout your collection. The checklist also really helps provide consistency when you need to compare the assessments that are performed by several different people. And something you might also want to add would be check boxes that would list priority levels as well. The checklist you use could be either on paper or a database, depending on how your institution keeps records as well. And once you've established the conditions present and the condition priority, you can combine that knowledge with the object's use and its mission relevance these are the building blocks that will let you create a preservation plan. So I want to point out that the next step after identifying condition is not immediately jumping to conservation. Getting conservation done may be a part of your preservation plan, but there's many other pieces that will contribute. So this is part of looking at your collection as a whole as well. And DIPSNY offers so many services to help institutions to create the plans and policies that you need. So I hope that you get a chance to take advantage of everything that they have to offer. I'd like to open this up for questions now. As my understanding is everyone is muted, but I'll be able to see any questions in the chat if you write them. Oh, I have someone asking me why no gloves for paper materials. Um, this is something that I feel fairly strongly about. I do not recommend using gloves when you're handling most paper materials. Um, this is because the gloves are going to reduce your sensitivity and they can snag on objects and you need your full dexterity when you're handling something. There's definitely exceptions to that. So I would recommend gloves if you're handling photographs or objects that are made of metal um, and certain, certain three-dimensional objects. Um, but for paper, the best thing to do is to freshly wash and dry your hands, but do not use gloves. Um, I have another question. What is the longevity of blueprint paper? Um, blueprints are, um, blueprints can be reasonably stable, but they do need special storage conditions. They're one of very few items that we do not recommend alkaline buffered storage materials. Um, if you're storing blueprints, you should look for non-buffered items. And you would also want to have things that have passed a thing that's called the uh, PAT, that's short for the photo activity test, because a blueprint will react to chemicals around it more than most pieces. Um, Blueprints are also moderately light sensitive, so you will want to control the light exposure that they're having as well. Um, my next question is, when the paper materials have broken apart, is there any way to put them back together that is safe, that isn't tape? Um, paper conservators would mend those with um, mulberry paper and wheat starch paste, but I really would not suggest this unless you've had training in person 
and a lot of experience because it can be very risky to introduce any moisture to a paper object. And so with a broken paper material, I would recommend using a mylar sleeve. The static, um, the static cling on that will hold your broken pieces in the place they need to be, but you're not actually attaching anything to the paper. And I think that's probably even faster than using tape, honestly, and it's definitely safer. I now have, when reviewing loose pieces of architectural drawings that are on ink, on translucent paper, and finding them medium priority so that the pieces are small enough that they'll disappear, is it better to encapsulate the pieces or would it be better to actually infill the paper or repair the tears? Um, I would recommend getting these mended by a paper conservator if that's within your institution's budget. Um, however, that often is not. And so especially uh, mending translucent paper can be very, very tricky. Um, so that's absolutely a thing you should bring to a conservator rather than trying uh, on your own. So once again, with architectural drawings, I would recommend mylar to keep the pieces together. Um, when we use the word encapsulation, that's usually uh, two pieces of mylar that are sealed together, either ultrasonically on all sides or else on two corners. So it's like a L shaped with two sides are open and two sides are sealed. Um, and as long as you can get one that's big enough for your drawings to be held, that's the safest way. I know architectural drawings can get really huge. And so if you cannot be storing them flat in mylar and you have to roll them, you may need to keep those pieces separated and just keep very good record controls of where those pieces are living. Oh, everyone's got architectural drawings. Uh, I see another question about supporting torn architectural drawings. And I think in handling that, I would recommend keeping that on a piece of paper, that you're handling the paper instead of the drawing. And for storage, I would recommend either a flat folder or mylar to keep pieces in place. Uh, and someone asks if there will be a link after this webinar finishes. And this complete webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the Dipsney website. Let's see. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Our contact info doesn't have Dipsney website, but it's dhpsny.org. And then if you go to webinars, you can see this one and all the other webinars that we've done as well. Um, I have a question about reduce, is there no easy treatment to reduce the spots caused by foxing to make them less visible? Um, there really is not. This is a thing that conservators can do, but it's often limited by what the paper can take. And I definitely do not recommend doing this on your own. Um, if it's a very important piece where you need to have the stains taken out, um, you should get in touch with us and right now while we're all working at home I'd be happy to do a Zoom consultation and look at your piece with you if you can access your collections as well. How do you recommend documenting the condition of manuscript materials stored and described in aggregate? Um, I think in this case uh, you would probably have similar conditions between all the manuscript materials in your folder or whatever group it's divided into. I think it is more useful to describe the condition of a lot of manuscript pages based on folder rather than an entire storage box because that's really losing all information. Um, but again, I would, I would keep track of it on the folder level instead of on the sheet level in that case. Oh, 
And I also see everyone who is an attendee will be receiving a recording of the presentation and a PDF of all of the slides. Uh, will full encapsulation of acidifying paper accelerate the acidification? That's a great question, and that's a fine distinction that you're making. Um, we generally do not recommend a full encapsulation when paper is becoming very acidic. One thing you can do is slide a piece of alkaline paper behind the paper if that is um, if that is a concern, and that will help to absorb some of the acid so it's not pickling in its own juices. Um, and I do recommend the L sleeve over a full encapsulation in most cases, also because I think most of you will not have access to an ultrasonic welder. Um, and we no longer recommend doing encapsulation with double-sided tape because I've seen too many cases where the document slides and gets stuck in the tape as well. But I think that you have to balance the, the risks of the mylar will trap some of the acids into the paper and it may accelerate some of the acidity, but at the same time, it's offering so much physical protection that you are protecting your document overall. Let's see. I have, what do you recommend for 19th century city directories? Uh, that are falling away from the binding, and they're some of our most used materials. Um, in this case, uh, hopefully we'll be providing more information about books in general, but I would recommend the way that you store them is very, use, is very important, uh, especially if those are an, sort of an oversized book. I think keeping them flat and keeping them in a four flap box will be very helpful when it's being stored. When they're being used, um, if you could encourage your researchers to use wedges so that you're not opening them completely to a 180 degree opening uh, every time they're looked at, uh, book wedges will support both sides and it will be much more gentle on the binding. Um, and neither of these things are really solving your problems, but they will help them to be used and to last a little longer. Okay, it looks like I'm not getting any new questions and we're right around one hour. So I'd like to thank you all very much for coming and attending and I'm available. If there's anything you want to follow up on, I would be delighted to talk more as well. Thank you very much for coming.